For our next presentation, we want to get a little more insight into education as it proceeds from the time that a child is first learning language into some other areas as well. And you know, you often hear that teachers are asking students to shh, you know, be quiet. We don't want to make too much noise. I think that our next presenter, Michael Horn, might disagree with that. He actually believes very much in disruptive innovation. So we're going to bring him up to make our next presentation. Please join me in welcoming Michael Horn towards student-centric learning. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, in, in reflecting about how I got to this point in my own life, I was thinking back when 9-11 hit. Actually, I had the luxury of having some time to do some soul searching. And a few months later, got an incredible job to work for David Gergen, the White House advisor uh, and, and now analyst. Uh, and it just really put me on a certain path to thinking about public policy and how to improve our society and so forth. And I went off to Harvard Business School with a plan in mind. And as so often happens, that plan lasted about as long as I was uh, on it. And uh, life threw me a curveball, which came in the form of my second year. I had the opportunity to take a class by total dumb luck from this professor, Clayton Christensen. And it totally changed the way I saw the world. In that class, uh, Clay, as we called him, uh, and, and still do, he, he uh, taught us about these theories of disruptive innovation, which just actually had so much predictive power in explaining how whole sectors in our world would transform and move from one state to another, why things had risen and fallen and so forth. And I was just so blown away with it, I just it totally changed my world perspective. It could explain how innovation, which seems so chaotic and unpredictable, could be far more predictable and successful. And midway through the class, he threw up this opportunity to me, which was to join him in co-authoring a book, taking his theories of disruptive innovation and applying them to our public education system. And I leapt at the chance. And it was interesting as I jumped in, because this process of disruptive innovation really explained how sectors transformed from things that were complicated and expensive and inaccessible and centralized into whole places where it was affordable, simple, and easy to use, accessible, decentralized, far more customizable. And it was, we could just look at sector after sector from computing, how it had taken computers that cost a couple hundred thousand dollars into desktop computing that filled our desktops, millions of us around the world, into smartphones that you all now have in your hands and can tune me out with because you have so much computing power <laughs> in your fingertips. It had transformed the way we had done, done such mundane things as taxes and made it far easier, and it transformed fundamentally the way we communicated. But what was interesting was, as we started to look at education, we really hadn't seen this process of disruptive innovation really take root. As the old sort of joke or story goes, if Rip Van Winkle came back awake after a hundred years slumber today, he'd be profoundly uncomfortable with society around him. Everything would be different. But the one place he would be profoundly comfortable would be in the classroom, in schools. He'd recognize those rows of desks with the teacher up front lecturing to students from a chalkboard, or maybe it was a whiteboard or an interactive whiteboard, but it wouldn't be much different. And of course, he'd recognize the school bell that dictated the pace of the day, the week, the calendar year, and how progress was measured through seat time. And this might be fine if the society hadn't changed so much, but because it has, what we ask and what we need our students to be able to do and what they need to be able to do to lead successful lives has changed dramatically. And so the fact that we have the same school system actually is a huge problem. It's not okay that it was built anymore to sort and does so remarkably well, such that 30% of our students drop out by high school and another half don't make it through college. It's not okay anymore that it was built to standardize, literally built to model that of a factory, such that we batch students up, send them into a classroom, quote unquote, add value to them and ship them out the other side. That wasn't okay anymore because what we were now asking was that every single human be able to get an education so that they could realize their fullest potential. And this standardization 
just clashes with the fact that we all have different learning needs at different times. What I've thrown up here is just some of the academic food fights over what those differences are. You can see there's a lot of disagreement. But what people don't disagree on is that people learn at different paces. They have different working memory capacities. They are motivated by different things and have different goals out of their education at different times. No one disagrees about that. And so if we have this need for customization, this monolithic factory model system we have had just won't cut it. As an earlier speaker was saying, it just won't allow us to realize that American dream. And so what we started to do was think about reimagining education. That's become my life work. And one of the insights we had was that schools do lots of jobs in our lives. Only one of them actually happens to be academic. And the question was, if we migrated the learning job to that of a computer, wouldn't we have an inherently modular architecture so that Michael Horn could learn physics at the path and pace that made sense for him, and Clay Christensen could learn it at a completely different path and pace? He's six foot eight, so he would also have a lot of basketball analogies. But then the question, very real one, was computers have been around for several decades. In schools, we've been spending wildly on them in the last couple decades, well over $60 billion by a conservative estimate in our book, Disrupting Class. But they haven't transformed anything, if we're being honest. The school model still looks largely the same. And the reason for this was we've done basically what every industry does when they first see a potentially disruptive innovation, which is to cram it into the existing model. And so we've crammed classroom computers stuck them in the back of classrooms so you could do a little PowerPoint, a little word processing, a little keyboarding as though our students today need that. But we've never fundamentally transformed the learning model itself. So the question was, how could you use it to move from this monolithic model toward a student-centric one? And as we thought about it, disruptive innovation had some things to say, which was the first one was disruptive innovation always starts in these areas of what we call non-consumption, where the alternative is literally nothing at all. And so starting it there allows you to literally reinvent the model completely and rethink all of your assumptions. So the mystery was, where would these areas of non-consumption be in US schooling? It's fairly obvious if you thought about the developing world. There are literally hundreds of millions of students around the world who do not have access to school, period where you could rethink the model. But in the US, schooling is largely compulsory. And it caused us to realize that if you actually looked at the course level, at disrupting class, there's actually lots of areas of non-consumption. I've just put up a sample of them up there in that slide. But credit recovery is a huge area of non-consumption. For example, in a lot of urban school districts today, students fail a course and have no way to remake the credit so they can't graduate or can't get vital learning critical to their future. Huge area to take online learning to literally reinvent the model. Dropouts are another one. 30% of our students, as we said, drop out before high school graduation. Huge area where they need a flexible model to allow them to get back on track and succeed. Advanced courses are another depressing one of non-consumption. 26% of high school students in 2007 attended a high school where there were no advanced courses, period, defined as anything above biology, so no chemistry, no physics, defined as anything above geometry, so no algebra two, forget about calculus, defined as any honors English class, period. In the state of Georgia a few years ago, there were 440 high schools and only 88 certified physics teachers. Huge areas of non-consumption to rethink the model, and what we saw was that actually the looming budget cuts and teacher shortages that are such a threat to today's system, actually, if you reframe it, could be seen as an opportunity, because they allow you to create more areas of non-consumption where you can take online learning to rethink the model fundamentally and do things differently. And indeed, Secretary Duncan, Secretary of Education, has talked about this, about the new normal, about state budget deficits of over 5%, crushing $260 billion in combined shortfalls for states over the next couple of years, 30 states having reduced K-12 expenditures in 2010, and a million teachers set to retire in the next few years. 
And while it seems bleak, it's actually a huge opportunity for innovation and for the online learning to plant itself and change the model. And we see it happening such that we made this projection that by 2019, the pace is so rapid right now that we expect 50% of all high school courses will be delivered online. Now, the question is, will this actually result in a student-centric model? And there's a lots of encouraging signs and there's some question marks. The encouraging thing is that what we've seen in every disruptive innovation is that technology predictably and reliably improves much faster than do our lives change. And we see it happening here as well. I'm sure a lot of you thought when I said online learning, I was referring to distance learning. It's increasingly not the case. Online learning is snapping itself into brick and mortar environments in what we call blended learning, where we're talking about any time a student is learning at least in part at a supervised brick and mortar location away from home, generally school, and at least in part through online delivery with some element of student control over the time, the place, the path, and or the pace. And so we're not talking about just simply taking an electronic whiteboard and beaming online curriculum at kids. And we're not talking about simply one-to-one -one laptops or digital textbooks in and of themselves, although they may be important enablers, because there's been no shift in the actual instructional and learning models. The other way we're seeing technology predictably improve is that the communication vehicles are just improving night and day. This is a screenshot of a virtual classroom, but with 3D screens coming online and touch screens and so forth, who knows the ability to connect students to students around the world, students to teachers and teachers to teachers. And the third way is that the content is starting to dramatically improve. This is a screenshot from the first ever video game based online American history course. It's called Conspiracy Code. It was offered by the Florida Virtual School a few years ago. In it, students run 10 missions to save American history from becoming corrupted. Many of you may be already joking that it's too late. <laughs> but for many students, this is a deeply motivating way for them to learn American history. And importantly, it's not for everyone. And that's just the point. Because we can have these customized pathways that hit at our motivations to really allow us to learn and realize our fullest human potential. And the online learning is really starting to show that in some dramatic ways that we don't learn at constant rates, that we need these pathways. This is a screenshot from the Khan Academy, started by Sal in a uh, blended school in Los Altos, California, a public school there. And what we see is a class of students learning math. And the blue highlighted line actually shows a student who started at the very bottom of the class. In the old system, would be grouped at the bottom group and would stay there throughout the year. But what it shows is that learning happened at some unpredictable paces. And if you look at days 20 through 30 there, you can see that student actually got stuck on one concept. And then something unlocked, right? And progress and just picked up. And that student, at the end of the uh, year, was in the top few in the class. So we can see it dramatically, and it makes us question the learning system we have today, where time is constant and learning is highly variable. Right now, we deliver content to students, we test and assess, we move you on regardless of whether you've mastered it and get the results afterwards, when instead we should be moving to a competency-based learning system, where time becomes the variable so that learning can be the constant. And so we deliver learning experiences to students. We test and assess to understand how they did. But rather than moving it on, we use it to inform learning and adjust and so forth. And students move on to other concepts and skills and so forth once they've truly mastered them. And this is the question marks. Will we have the courage to take this opportunity to really reinvent the way we think of time in the system? the way we think about space. We can literally reconstruct learning environments now. We don't need the classroom egg crate structure of schools we've always had. We can have huge open learning environments with breakout rooms around to really allow students to explore in the way that makes sense for them. And we can reimagine the role of the teacher as well. Teachers will be absolutely critical in this world. But their jobs can be very different because the online learning can free them up from delivering one-size-fits-none lectures and instead become the facilitator of learning, the motivator, the learning coach, the mentor, the mentors that I had, like David Gergen and Clay Christensen. 
It can free up all teachers to have considerably more time to do that, so it's not dumb luck that you get one. It can allow some teachers to be virtual content experts, really specialize in that content, and other teachers, they don't have to have anything to do with content at all. They can be something like caseworkers to deal with all those non-academic problems that are so critical to learning in many cases. Indeed, rather than using data to be the autopsy that determines how much of our students did or did not get something right, we can instead use it to personalize learning, to match the right experience for the right student at the right time. And so the question out of all this is that should this be the new normal? Or should this picture of a student-centric learning with students being able to customize learning for their different needs and maximize their fullest human potential in a student-centric system, shouldn't that just be normal? Thank you.